Good morning and welcome to the seventh meeting of the committee in 2015. Uh, everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones and other electronic equipment as they affect the broadcasting system. Some committee members may consult tablets during the meeting. Uh, this is because we provide meeting papers in digital format. Uh, we have apologies this morning from Alec Riley. Uh, agenda item one is consideration of a negative SSI. That's the Non-Domestic Rate Scotland Order 2015, SSI 2015-47. Members have a cover note from the clerk explaining the instrument. Uh, as you will note, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee did not have any comments to make on this instrument. Do members have any comments? Uh, are we agreed not to make any recommendation to the Parliament on this instrument? Thank you. Uh, agenda item two today uh, is our ninth and final uh, oral evidence session on the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill. Uh, today we are taking evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, who is accompanied by his officials from the Scottish Government's Bill team. Uh, I plan to take questions in each part of the Bill in turn, starting with air weapons uh, and moving through the Bill in order. I would hope we can conclu conclude the session by about 12.30 at the latest. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Michael Matheson, MSP, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, Quentin Fisher, Bill Team Leader, Peter Reid, Senior Policy Officer, Walter Drummond-Murray, Policy Officer, and Keith Main, Policy Manager of the Scottish Government. Uh, before we move on to questions, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask if you'd like to make an opening statement? Uh, no convener. I'm happy just to move straight to questions. That's uh, grand. Thank you very much. And if we start off uh, with air weapons, um, Cabinet Secretary, it's been suggested that the introduction of a licensing regime for air weapons will do nothing to reduce criminality or increase public safety, as those who choose to misuse such weapons would not apply for a licence. How would you respond to that suggestion? Uh, well, I don't necessarily agree with that, because um, by creating the uh, licensing provision, uh, we are uh, requiring individuals who uh, wish to or may have an air weapon to have a licence for that. The thing that's worth keeping in mind is that uh, air weapons are uh, lethal uh, weapons that can uh, kill and maim individuals uh, very uh, seriously. So. It's important we have a regime in place that allows us to try and uh, deal with some of those risks that are associated uh, with them. Clearly, there will be those who will uh, choose not to have a licence. If they choose not to do so, then they will be committing an offence. Uh, and what we are doing is providing uh, uh, the police with the powers which are necessary, so that if uh, they uh, deem it appropriate, an individual isn't given a licence uh, for holding uh, an air weapon. Uh, and equally, if they uh, do hold a licence uh, then, and they're using the air weapon inappropriately um, or in an unsuitable way, then the police have got powers in order to take action on that. And I think that's a, an appropriate mechanism which can assist us in preventing some of the uh, criminality that's associated with, uh, with uh, air weapons. Thank you. Claire Adamson, please. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, there's inevitably been some cap comparisons with the, um, the licensing of shotguns and in, in the comparison between what's been proposed here. And there's certainly a great expectation from the people like um, the League of Cruel Sports that this will make a significant difference. However, with the licensing for shotguns, um, it compelled behavioural change in terms of where weapons would be stored. Um, but this licence, as it stands, um, the, the individual air gun won't be identified and also there's no limit on the number of air guns that can be applied to a licence. Do you have any concerns that maybe um, it won't go far enough and that the police will still have problems in identifying who owns a particular air, air gun uh, and if it's used in a criminal situation? Well, there are obviously um, uh, uh, there are certain there are sort of different provisions for shotguns and also for firearms. Um, all firearms obviously have to have a, um, a, a, a registration number on them. Not all shotguns have as well. Um, and uh, uh, as it stands, air weapons don't have um, a registration number on them uh, either. Uh, so the approach that we've taken is is one which is about uh, licensing the individual uh, and assessing their individual. 
uh, uh, whether they're appropriate, uh, where it's appropriate they should actually have uh, an air weapon in itself. Um, uh, we've also tried to make sure that the, uh, the licensing regime, which we're introducing for air weapons, uh, is broadly similar to that of uh, firearms and uh, shotguns. Um, uh, but uh, we're trying to do it in a proportionate way as well. So um, I think overall it would be fair to say that the bill tries to strike that balance, and I believe that it's got that balance right uh, by focusing on the individual and that the licence is associated with the individual themselves. Uh, if we were to get into a situation where each individual uh, air weapon was to be licensed, uh, you would then be in a situation where all air weapons that are manufactured and produced uh, would have to have a serial number uh, on them, uh, which is simply not the case, uh, and it's not how they are produced at the present moment. So uh, the system we're introducing is reflective of the situation we have at the moment. If at some point in the future that changed, then clearly that's something which could be revisited at that point. Thank you. OK. John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Can we just get clarification in terms of shotgun, the holders of shotgun licences? My understanding is it's not the individual shotgun that's licensed, it's the individual shotgun is registered uh, with the licence holder. Uh, and just so that we get clarification that you do not, you do not apply for an individual licence for a shotgun, you, you apply for a licence to be a shotgun holder, but the individual weapons are then registered with the police. Is that correct? It's correct. It's my understanding of it. And the, as I mentioned, the serial numbering of them yep. is different from that of a firearm. Yeah. We have, as a committee, discussed the issue about the, how we get individual markers for air weapons and look at the possibility. Uh, and we'd hope that the Scottish Government would look at some way of being able to, when people do register for an air weapons licence, that we can find a way to actually have those uh, individual weapons marked in some way that they can be identified and traced against an individual owner. I, I know that the, because of the production of air weapons and most of the production takes place out with the UK and most manufacturers do not have an individual identifier on the weapons as they are manufactured. But it would be useful, Cabinet Secretary, if we could get some way or some consideration uh, to being able to individually mark those uh, air weapons so that when they are registered or the registered holder can register those with the police so if there is any incidents involving air weapons then the police will be able to easily identify who the owner of those air weapons would be I, I fully understand uh, where Mr Wilson is coming from on this particular issue I think the challenge would be is in creating a system which would actually uh, not lend itself to being misused um, uh, the, the benefit you obviously have with the serial number process for firearms is that it's at the point of manufacture. It's uh, a system which um, is much more difficult to tamper with uh, as well. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it would be a much wider issue for us to try and deal with the whole issue of um, air weapons actually having a, a serial number embedded into them, uh, which would obviously uh, go well beyond uh, Scotland and it would be a, a, a probably have to be taken forward on a European-wide basis because there are some European uh, regulations around firearms as well. Um, uh, so, but I, I do appreciate the, the purpose and intent uh, of what you would like to achieve with that, but it would be out with the scope of what we have at the present moment to try and achieve that. Hence why we've taken what we believe is a pragmatic approach in licensing the individual uh, in order to try and help to start to improve uh, the way in which air weapons are actually held within the community. Cabinet Secretary, uh, just to move on to the cost of uh, applying for a licence. Uh, I know that there's, this government are keen to go for full cost recovery in terms of applying for a licence. Now, we know that the UK government are currently considering uh, the costs of registering uh, firearms uh, and shotguns. The figures that are being presented, uh, the are talking about a UK figure of £88, but I've just read information as of last night that there's figures from ACPOS have indicated that the expected cost or the cost to register a firearm or shotgun is expected to cost the police in the region of £196 uh, for the follow-through. 
uh, and that if equates to a subsidy of £146 for every licence applied for. And the reason why I'm asking this question about the full cost recovery is that if shotgun licences are, according to ACWOS, cost £196 to process, and the UK government, because they control <coughs> the fees charged for licensing weapons and short, uh, drive, uh, sh sorry, shotguns, the, the issue would be if we go for a full cost recovery for air weapons based on the ACPOS costs, would that not mean that effectively you're paying double the price to license an air weapon than you would be for a, a rifle or shotgun? Uh, not necessarily. I think, first of all, uh, to be clear, we obviously don't control um, the, uh, the fees that are set for both uh, firearms and for shotguns, both of which are at £50 at the present moment. Um, and the uh, uh, Home Office are uh, looking at the possibility of increasing that. I don't think it's increased for some time, actually, and I think there's a general view that it should have increased anyway, but it, um, whether it will go to full cost recovery as yet um, is a matter for the, the Home Office to uh, determine, although I do understand they are looking at two different types of costs, a different cost for um, a, a shotgun and a different cost for a firearms uh, at the present moment. I think it would be fair to say, though, that the checks that will be undertaken for the purposes of uh, an air weapon will not be to the same degree as they would be for a firearm. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the, the nature of the work that will be taken forward by the police will not be as, as onerous as it would be for someone who was applying for a firearms uh, certificate. So, for example, uh, a large part of this will actually be for the uh, police to consider the application and it may be for them to do um, a, 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 a quick check, almost like a disclosure check, uh, on whether they see anything in an individual's background that would suggest that they shouldn't be allowed to have a firearm, uh, and also where they stay and the purpose for which it's intended. Um, it, it is unlikely to involve, uh, it, to any great extent, home visits, uh, inspection of the uh, location of the actual device, etc. So the, the nature uh, of the regime for air weapons licensing is not going to be as onerous as it will be for firearms. Uh, therefore, it would be reasonable to expect the cost of that to be uh, significantly less as a result. But what we have to do is to wait for the outcome of the Home Office's decision on what that rate should actually be for firearms and shotguns. And once they have uh, determined that level, that will then allow us to then look at what we should be setting the, um, uh, the, the fee for our an air weapons licence here in Scotland, and that will obviously be taken forward through secondary legislation. Cabinet Secretary, are you or any of your uh, department involved in negotiations with the Home Office regarding the setting of the fees for firearms and shotguns? Because while you're saying that, the, in that response, the, the indication would be you would await the outcome of the deliberations by the Home Office in terms of the licence fees, uh, in terms of firearms and shotguns, and that may impact on uh, the fees that may be charged for a fire uh, for a air weapon. Uh, it's just trying to get clarification in terms of whether or not the intention is to go for full cost recovery uh, for an air weapon, uh, and rather than just do a comparison with the licence fees, because uh, for a air, you know, a shotgun or uh, other weapons, uh, and it's just trying to get that clear. <coughs> Uh, that uh, if, are we looking to have some kind of comparator with the fees charged for shotguns and other <coughs> weapons compared to air weapons? So we've indicated to the Home Office that we believe there should be an increase in the fee for firearms and shotguns. Um, uh, it will be ultimately for them to determine what that particular fee should be. We would like to, with regards to um, air weapons licensing, uh, try to get as close to full cost recovery as we could, but we'll have to wait to see how far we can, uh, we can pursue that, dependent on the approach that's taken by the Home Office and the fee setting that they have for both uh, firearms and for uh, shotguns. As I'm sure members would appreciate it. It would be difficult to have a fee which was significantly higher for an air weapon uh, than it was for a firearms or for a shotgun. Um, 
uh, but uh, we think that we should try to get to that point of close as, to, as close to full cost recovery as we can, but we will have to wait to see what the final outcome is from the, the Home Office's determination in this matter. But we have indicated to them uh, that we would like to see the fees for both firearms and shotguns increasing. Thank you. Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very Good much. Morning. I'm concerned, or we are concerned, about group licences. What about for clubs, things like triathlon people who are having air guns and using them for, for off-premises? I mean, are we going to licence, are you intending to licence, it's not very clear here, are you intending to licence the group as a whole or one holder of the group? Because often it's younger people who have these, these guns at home or, or in their place for the triathlons or whatever it is, the tetrathlons and things like that. And the group thing is not very clear here. You know, how are, we going, are we going to license the club? Or are you going to license the manager of the club or the person who holds the, the gun? OK. I'll, I'll try to give you some clarification on that. And I'll also ask officials maybe just to give further, some further detail in terms of the content of the bill uh, and the specific uh, aspects of it. Uh, the general approach is obviously for the club to obviously have a licence as a shooting club, but also for individuals who are holding an air weapon to also have uh, their individual licence as well. So for a, um, if they wish to own a licence, uh, so to own a, a, a purchase a, an air weapon, then they're going to be required to have a, a licence for that uh, purpose. Um, there are some provisions, as you're aware, in the bill for those who are uh, under 18 to uh, 14, uh, where they can have a licence, but it's got specific conditions set on the circumstances in which they can use it, for example, in shooting clubs um, uh, or in private land. Um, uh, and for those who are under 14, it's, uh, it's if they are with uh, um, an adult, um, uh, someone who's uh, 21 or above, um, if they are going to use an air weapon on uh, private land. That broadly mirrors uh, the approach that we have within uh, firearms legislation as well. But if I maybe get officials, maybe just to give a bit more detail on some of the group, group aspect and how that would actually work in practice as well, which may be helpful. Um, if I could say briefly, the, the bill has a, a reference in it to the approval of clubs, and um, we are meeting with Scottish Char Target Shooting Federation uh, uh, next month, and with the Scottish Air Rifles and Pistols Association, we're in discussion with them about how clubs will work in practice. What the bill does, it, it, it sets a, an outline for an approval process so that uh, to mirror existing rifle clubs, for example, it's possible for a club to apply for a licence for a set premises and the police would, would look at the, the premises, for example, and, and, and uh, give approval if, if they uh, consider that public safety is not compromised or whatever. There's also within Schedule 1 to the Bill uh, a series of exemptions um, and uh, there are also permits, for example, for events. So you mentioned uh, tetrathlons and, and events like that. If there is an event, such as a pony club event or a Highland Games or whatever, at which air rifle shooting, air weapon shooting is taking place, the event organiser can apply for a permit and then any individual can shoot within the conditions of that event without having their own individual licence. So it's a decision to take, as the Cabinet Secretary said, if, if you want to have your own air weapon you would apply for an individual licence, but clubs, uh, there, there's an exemption for people if they're shooting within the boundaries of a, an approved event or an approved club uh, down the line. It was for things like away matches that really, you know, if when, they go, when they go away where the premises aren't particularly licensed, if they go to Carlisle or somewhere in the south um, for, a, for a match, for something like that, for a shooting club or a, to travel, and that was really what I was meaning. But that seems to be clear in as you said, that you're speaking next week to them. We're, we're, we're talking to the clubs and, uh, about how exactly that would work and, and our uh, our, our thinking is that we would set out the exact processes in secondary legislation and or guidance as we, as we work through that with the, uh, with the with the federation and with other organisations. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe just to explain part of the reason for doing some of this in secondary legislation is it allows us to, if there are particular unintended consequences that come up, that we can actually tweak the system um, in order to accommodate any particular difficulties that may have arisen that weren't the intention of it as well. So it just gives us a bit of flexibility and be able to change some of these things going forward. 
Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Cara Helton, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just moving back to the resourcing of the bill, it's been suggested that the introduction of the licensing scheme will prove to have a significant impact in terms of resources for Police Scotland. Um, I wonder if you can assure the committee that Police Scotland will have the necessary resources at its disposal to administer the scheme, particularly in light of um, the possibility that there could be dealing with tens of thousands of applications. So um, one of the things we've been doing is uh, discussing with Police Scotland the best way in which we can actually uh, manage the what well, will be a significant increase in the number of licences that will have to be issued um, as a result of the uh, legislation. Uh, what I found interesting is that there are quite significant peaks and troughs uh, in uh, firearms uh, and shotgun registrations. So there are periods when, um, uh, uh, when they are busy with them and there are periods uh, over a couple of years when they're quiet. They happen to be getting into a busy the period, the, 15 to 7, the 2015 to 2017 period is a period when they get to a peak in terms of re-registration of, of uh, uh, firearms. So one of the things that we've been discussing with the police is to try and uh, uh, shift as much of the air weapons stuff to the period when they're quieter. So part of the work we're doing with them is looking at how we commence introduction of the bill in order to look at the lead-in time for when people have to have a certificate so that it moves towards a period when they are at a quieter period in order to try and level that uh, amount of work out for them. So we're, we're working with them uh, in order to look at achieving that and some of the commencement provisions within the bill will be taken forward with a view to looking to achieve that as well um, in order to reduce the potential ever-increasing burden that they may face uh, over the next two years uh, by adding uh, air weapons to that uh, at that particular point as well, which may make it difficult for them. So we are, we are keen to work with them and we're already engaged with them and looking to how we can achieve that most effectively. Do you want to come back? Um, yeah, just as a wee supplementary, and um, the Cabinet Secretary has already hinted at the response here, um, Police Scotland have suggested a number of steps that would smooth the application process um, and uh, sort of avoid peak pressure points, and you've already talked about this a bit. I wonder if you would be amenable, amenable to bring in for, um, appropriate amendments at stage two to uh, give effect to these smoothing proposals that Police Scotland are suggesting. If, if, there's a, if there's a reasonable way in which we can achieve that, and also some of the provisions around the commencement of different aspects of the bill that can assist us in achieving that as well, so the lead-in time before they, they are commenced can assist in achieving that. I'm very open to, to working with them in order to do that. And, uh, the database system which they use is Shogun uh, for the registration of these types of things, which they've said is more than capable, which is a, a recently uh, a developed piece of software because with the legacy force, eight forces of our different systems operating. So we're now down to a single system for the whole of Scotland for the registration of uh, firearms, is that the system is fit for purpose, which they've confirmed is the case uh, in order to take forward the registration. Thank you. Willie Coffey, please. Thanks very much, convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Could morning. I turn briefly to um, uh, the other side of this, perhaps towards uh, failure to licence people who fail to licence and are perhaps going to commit further offences with air guns. Uh, I know the, the expectation is that you know, prosecutions for licences and offences are likely to be picked up in terms of investigation of other crime and so on and so forth. But is there a penalty, uh, is there a penalty in, in your mind at the moment that will apply to a person who fails to, to register an air gun when they are apprehended or investigated for perhaps some other crime? Okay. Well, obviously, would be in terms of prosecution, would be a matter for the Procurator Fiscal and the Crown Office and how they take that forward, and also the sanction that's applied would be a matter for the courts. Um, so I'm uh, reluctant to say what it should actually be, because it a, it's a matter for the, the courts to determine independently um, of ourselves. Uh, what I could say is that one of the things we are looking at is in the commencement of the bill is how we can manage some of these things in that... Uh, the reasonable period of time for someone to actually get, if they have an air weapon, to get it registered, um, and the public information campaign which will surround that in making sure that those who presently own an air weapon uh, are aware that they will have to get a licence for it as well, and how we can manage some of these things. And there's obviously an element for the um, uh, for the Procurator Fiscal's Office and for the Crown Office to uh, to work with us and how we can take that forward. So, um, in terms of the Determination of uh, the actual sanction would be a matter for the courts, and prosecution would obviously be for the, the PF and Crown Office. But um, uh, I 
believe that, that it's important that, uh, that uh, we have a good information campaign to make sure that the potentially half a million air weapons that are out there, that their owners are aware that you have a responsibility to actually now have it licensed. Um, and if uh, if uh, and if you don't, then you potentially could be committing an offence uh, and could find yourself prosecuted. Um, uh, and it would be, for, as I say, the courts to determine and what's the most appropriate sanction, depending on the individual circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect you might say the same thing, but could I just take the question <coughs> further? Uh, should, should a person, uh, as you indicated in some of your opening remarks, uh, go on to commit an offence and that they can be particularly serious and they can lead to to death, do you, do, you, do you anticipate or would you imagine that there would be a different outcome imposed on a person who does commit such an offence who doesn't have a licensed weapon? Or is that something you would rather <laughs> not speculate on? Well, if they don't have a licence, there's the offence that they've committed in itself and if they have injured someone with an air weapon, but there's also the offence which they've committed if they don't have it, uh, a licence for it as well. So. Uh, and I would expect courts to, to, to take that into account at the time when any case is brought before them. So there's uh, uh, potentially uh, you know, more than one offence being committed there. Not, it's not just a case of not having a licence. It's also if they've injured someone um, or killed someone, uh, then there's another offence uh, which they can be prosecuted on. So they can be, um, if they don't have a licence, uh, that could be one of the factors that they could find themselves getting prosecuted for. Thank you. Okay, Claire Adamson, very briefly, please. Very briefly, it's, it's supplementary both in my original question and, and, and Mr Coffey's is, is what will be the criminal element of this, Minister? And um, we did take evidence from the police who said that um, misuse of, um, I think it's pinking or plinking that they use at the moment, is can be dealt with under current legislation and obviously any animal cruelty elements are also um, criminal activities at the moment, but it's this idea of how do you determine ownership of a weapon that's been used in that situation when there is no link between the licence holder and a particular air weapon? What, what would be the criminality um, for someone not having a licence and how would that be identified? And as I said, it, there's no compulsion on the, the licensee to store the weapons at a particular address, so could someone not just say, oh, borrowed it, basically? Well, the well, it will be an offence to have an air weapon uh, that doesn't have a licence. Um, so if they don't have a licence for it, they're committing an offence from the outset. Um, uh, so, uh, for example, say the police turn up at uh, a property um, uh, on a domestic uh, dispute and they find, um, and while they're there, they see uh, an air weapon, an air rifle, uh, sitting in the hall. Uh, just now, they're powerless to do anything about that. Uh, and uh, I've got no knowledge about what it might be getting used for. Uh, so uh, they'll now be in a position where uh, they'll be able to say, well, have you got a licence for that? And if the person doesn't have a licence for it, then they'll be committing an offence. Equally, at the time when they apply for the licence, um, they have to explain to the police uh, the purpose for which they want the licence for the air weapon. So what do, how do they intend to use it? So is it for, uh, for example, um, uh, is it for uh, uh, vermin control? Uh, is, it, um, is it for sporting purposes? Um, is it um, uh, for uh, plinking? So if it's for plinking, there's then an issue about you would consider the circumstances and the environment the person may live and where that may be taking place. Um, uh, so it's, it, these are, that's part of the check at the time when they apply for it. What's the purpose of the air weapon for? Uh, so, for example, if it's someone who's applying for an air weapon to do plinking and they stay in a tenement and they have a shared back garden with the rest of the folk in that particular tenement, uh, the police are likely to say, well, we don't think it's appropriate for you to actually have an air weapon to do uh, to undertake that within uh, 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 a shared back garden in a tenement. So, um, uh, so that's, the, that's the approach that the police will be able to take with the legislation. But in terms of um, uh, linking a particular instant to a particular uh, a weapon will always be a challenge. It can be a challenge for firearms and for shotguns as well. And just earlier this week, the British Transport Police were putting out a call for evidence for a, a railway worker who was shot with a, an air gun uh, in my constituency in High Bonnie Bridge. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, that's the type of thing which people continue to experience. But, um, uh, you know, we do provide powers for police where they see an air weapon to check if it's got a licence. If it hasn't got a licence, they're in a position where they can have that, that person's committing an offence and it can be seized. Okay. 
very much. We will now move on to alcohol licensing. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, we have uh, heard uh, quite a lot about the Bright Crew Court decision. Uh, can I ask you uh, what you think the Bright Crew Court decision has had, uh, what effect it has had on licensing decision making generally, uh, and what, if any, steps the Government plans to take to address this? Well, I think our uh, general view about the uh, Bright Crew uh, decision was that um, it, it confirmed the uh, the purpose for which um, uh, alcohol licences are for in premises. Um, uh, uh, there was clearly an issue about the way in which um, this particular case was taken forward and the way in which um, uh, the licensing board in Glasgow City Council uh, uh, sought to use that for other elements of entertainment that were taking place within the particular um, uh, establishment. It, it would probably... This, the Bright Crew case probably gives reason as to why we have chosen to take a licensing position around the provision of um, uh, other types of entertainment that can take place in these premises. And that's why we've made this additional provision uh, within the legislation for a further licensing uh, measure that can be taken forward by a local authority for, uh, 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 for example, uh, uh, sexual entertainment that's been offered within a premises uh, and that the licensing uh, uh, authority are now in a position where they can have a stated policy in this area. Uh, we'll come to the sexual entertainment aspects uh, later, uh, but obviously um, you are, are making provision to, to close these loopholes. Um, however, uh, in correspondence um, from the police, uh, around about members' clubs, and we've taken a fair bit of evidence. Uh, we we know that um, members' clubs are not included in an assessment of over provision, uh, and cannot be refused a, a premises license uh, or uh, uh, on or variation on those grounds. Uh, they have no requirement to have a DPM, uh, and there is no requirement to have the sale and supply of alcohol authorised by a personal license holder. Uh, also, we have heard that there is a fair amount of use of occasional licences uh, in members' clubs. Um, do you think that those legislative loopholes should be closed and that the same rules should apply to members' clubs as to other licensed premises? Um, I'm aware that there are some issues at the time when the, um, uh, the 2005 Act was being taken forward in Parliament. Uh, uh, Parliament made the decision that members' clubs should have some extra provisions, uh, largely reflective of uh, very often the nature that they have within some of our communities, whether they be um, uh, associated with um, uh, particular companies or businesses that used to factories that used to be based there, social clubs, etc., um, sports clubs uh, in some ways that had a, a members' club attached to them. So uh, Parliament took the view that they had a particular value within the community, and therefore that the licensing regime should reflect that, uh, and that they should be given certain exemptions uh, or provisions within the licensing act. Uh, I'm still of the view that they have an important part to play, um, and uh, I think any changes would have to be very carefully considered about the potential negative consequences they could have on uh, members' clubs, many of which don't necessarily operate on a commercial basis. Um, they're not uh, in the same way of um, uh, full profit-making uh, businesses. So I think we would have to be very careful about any changes that were being proposed. But, of course, I'm open to the committee's views in this matter. <coughs> if there are particular aspects that you uh, believe could be addressed uh, or should be addressed, I'm uh, open to considering them. But I would wish to be very careful about any changes that could have or introduce any changes that could have unintended consequences. The other thing as well around occasional licences. Um, you know, the first thing to say is that occasional licences shouldn't be abused. Um, and it's important that uh, local licensing boards are ensuring that is the uh, case um, where there is evidence that they are being misused, whether it be by members' clubs or others, then I would expect the local licensing board to take appropriate action in order to ensure that's not happening. So there's absolutely no reason why local licensing boards can't take forward measures if they do believe that they are being misused by a particular members' club or any other party. It has been suggested by a number of witnesses that uh, occasional licences become 
almost permanent licences because it's the norm for um, a club or another body to apply uh, for the same thing again and again and again. Um, do you feel that that is a, an abuse of the occasional licence system? Uh, and how do we ensure that uh, licensing boards do not continue to sign off uh, occasional licences which become the norm? So the purpose of the occasional licence was to provide some flexibility in there for uh, uh, local licensing boards that where there were circumstances that may arise that they would be able to provide that occasional uh, uh, licence. And, um, uh, uh, you know, there are uh, some provisions within the legislation of, um, uh, uh, of uh, for, for example, for voluntary organisations, um, uh, that in any period of 12 months, the total number of days which an occasional licence are issued may not exceed uh, 56. Um, I, you know, if there is if there is clear evidence within a particular local authority area that there is a, a misuse of the uh, provisions within the Act uh, in the way in which they are. Uh, taking forward occasional licences, then that's something that we can consider in terms of our engagement with the, the clerks of licensing boards, uh, and if necessary, to consider whether there's any further guidance that needs to be issued to them uh, on how they should be uh, used uh, and when they shouldn't be used. So, um, if there's clear evidence of that, I'm more than happy for our officials to look at providing further guidance to um, uh, uh, licensing board clerks in order to give them uh, some further direction on that issue. Does the government uh, currently analyse um, the amount of occasional licences that uh, are issued by each board? Um, uh, I'm not aware of that, but Peter uh, Reid is probably better placed to advise you on that. The, we collect figures on premises licences and personal licences. Unfortunately, at the moment, we don't collect figures on the number of occasional licences. We do believe that there's quite a considerable number applied for. Uh, just to track back. There is an order making part already in existence that would allow us to impose a limit on the number of occasional licences that, are prem that can be applied for related to a premises licence or a personal licence. So that part hasn't been used yet, but something equivalent to the 56 days in relation to voluntary, voluntary clubs could be applied if, if necessary. Uh, it would seem to me that, uh, in terms of the evidence that we've taken, that this is a, a major problem for, for some. I think it may be wise if those figures were collected and analysed um, at Cabinet Secretary so that uh, in future you could see if there is a real problem in certain places or not. Uh, it may well be that some folk are egg over-egging the pudding, but it, that does not seem to be the case. Convener, let, let us take that issue away and, um, uh, and we can consider what further work can be done in terms of trying to get a, a better handle on the figures uh, within different licensing board areas and also what further measures could assist in addressing some of the concerns that the committee have heard on this issue. Thank you. Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I noticed that the word voluntary organisations hasn't really been defined. I mean, people can say, what is, how, are you intending to define it a bit more clearly the word voluntary organisations with these occasional licences? I'm not sure whether within the existing that there is, but I would presume that it would be tied in with the statutory uh, provision that we have for voluntary organisations. The voluntary organisations, correctly, they are, they are not currently defined. That, my understanding is that that expression has been in the legislation since it was introduced, and certainly I was looking at my... I was looking at a paralegal handbook the other day and the, the author was suggesting that although, as you point out, there is no definition, there doesn't, he, he wasn't aware of any particular abuse of the lack of definition. But if there were to be issue, you know, if we were aware of concerns, we could certainly look at that. Okay, thanks. Was, was, some people have said that it should be a bit more closely defined. That was all. It was one of the submissions that said... You know, if there, as, uh, as Peter Reid has said, if there, was a, if there is an identifiable problem, we can look at uh, addressing that. The most obvious way to do that is to tie it into registration as a voluntary organisation, uh, which uh, voluntary organisations have got a legal responsibility to do. So it's, it's you know, if, if it was necessary. But um, uh, I would be keen to see whether there's any evidence of whether there's a problem or not. Thank you. Wilson, please. Thank you, Kim Wilson, Cabinet Secretary, we have heard from health organisations and other organisations that have indicated uh, that one of the things we should be trying to do with this piece of legislation is look at the over-provision 
uh, in terms of in the effects alcohol has in, community, in very many communities throughout Scotland. Uh, and the suggestion is that uh, the licensing board should take, be more proactive in terms of trying to make sure that there is uh, a clear statement made by the local authority or the licensing board in terms of over-provision and that they should be monitor that very carefully. But we heard from some licensing clerks that said that at the present moment, uh, the legislation in place doesn't allow them to be as proactive as some organisations would like them to be. Do you see this legislation uh, and the advice or guidance given to licensing boards and to the clerks that we can see a real shift, uh, sea change in terms of the over-provision of licensed premises within communities throughout Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. I'm always interested when some say that they think that the legislation doesn't go far enough in giving them guidance in this because you can go to one licensing board area and they will actually take a very proactive approach in this particular issue and then you can go into a neighbouring licensing board and they take a less proactive uh, approach. So I'm not entirely convinced it's all to do with the legislation in itself. Part of it, I think, is also about making sure that you know, public health is one of the five key principles on which uh, licensing policy uh, is founded and should be taken forward. Uh, a big part of it is about making sure that the local licensing policy is properly reflective of that and there's good engagement between the different stakeholders, particularly uh, with their uh, uh, colleagues in health around uh, their role in uh, making comment on it. And the legislation already makes some provision for that. One of the things we're doing with this particular bill is obviously is uh, giving greater scope for licensing boards to consider uh, the area where over-provision may take place, not just within a small locality, but within that wider uh, licensing board's uh, area. So that gives them more scope to look at it and also to look at issues such as the hours um, uh, uh, that are uh, provided for for different licensed premises within the area. Um, as well. So it gives them more flexibility uh, to consider a wider range of issues um, on, uh, uh, on over-provision. You know, I should say, as, you know, as a former Minister for Public Health, you know, this is an area which I think is uh, where we can make more progress, and I would like to see more progress being taken forward. As I say, there are some licensing boards that have been enlightened and have been much more proactive, and I'd like to see more of them being so as well. An important part of that is to make sure that the local licensing policies that they're taking forward are more reflective of that. And um, I, I'm keen for us to look at where there's any further measures that we can take forward at a, a national level, whether it be through guidance um, or through uh, work with licensing board members themselves, uh, to make sure that the whole issue of over-provision and how that ties into public health is seen as being an important part of their responsibility and how they take forward their policy. Cabinet Secretary, I welcome that uh, statement. The difficulty is, as, as you outlined in your opening comment there, is the discrepancy that seems to exist between the interpretation of the current legislation and the powers that the boards have. Uh, what assurances can you give us that those discrepancies between the interpretation from one board to another is such that we can actually see greater clarity uh, in terms of the application of the legislation uh, that's going to be applied because one of the, uh, and unfortunately, and you mentioned yourself in your previous role uh, as public health minister, you saw for yourself examples of where over provision, particularly in terms of off sales, uh, was having a dramatic effect on the health and well being of many communities throughout Scotland. So, what assurances can we have that those, um, the impact of that health impact in terms of communities will be addressed in, as part of this legislation? So part of the additional scope we're giving to licensing boards and the range of things that they can consider uh, when it comes to the issue of over-provision uh, extends the scope of that. So that, as I mentioned, around hours of operation of a particular establishment and also uh, being able to look at the wider area, not just that locality uh, or that immediate locality in its, uh, itself. So it allows them wider scope um, to take in these factors. Um, the other part is about the, um, some aspects around the, um, the alignment of the local licensing policies and how uh, boards arrive at that. There has been some difficulty, for example, around the way in which they've been taken forward and how they align with local government elections as well. So we're obviously taking forward some measures to assist in helping 
uh, to uh, achieve that. I think one of the things that um, struck me in the past in my previous role was that um, uh, is it good practice isn't always as widely disseminated as it should be. Uh, and uh, there are certain things we do at a national level in terms of through uh, uh, different stakeholder groups and different uh, uh, events that take place about trying to uh, spread and embed some of that good practice. Um, so I think there's still, uh, I accept there's still a significant way to go. I think, um, uh, I don't think it's just about legislation. Uh, some of it's about policy approach as well. Um, and it's about making sure that it's seen as being a much higher priority for those that those bold areas that don't consider it as high a priority as it should be. And part of that is about the type of guidance and type of direction uh, and some of the work we do with uh, licensing boards and with other stakeholders to make sure it seems being a priority. But also the other part is to make sure that local territorial health boards um, are very proactive uh, on the local licensing forum uh, and also in uh, responding to whether it be new applications uh, or to major variations which they have to be consulted on is that they are very clear about what their position is and also uh, that they respond to these in, a, in an appropriate way uh, to inform licensing boards. So um, I would be, you know, trying to get everybody to move in the same direction at the same time is never an easy thing. But in terms of making sure that it is seen as being a major priority and it has to be something that they have been, need to be more proactive on, is uh, there's a range of things in the bill and also work that we're doing that can assist us in helping to achieve that. Thank you. Uh, Claire Adamson, please. Thank you, Thank you Convener. Um, there's a couple of um, questions, Cabinet Secretary, in relation to personal licence holders. Um, the bill seeks to remove the automatic five-year ban for those who have, have not retrained for personal licences, but there will be quite a number of people caught up before the bill's introduction, um, and, and obviously that has a detrimental effect on their employment. Um, prospects if they, they have that ban. Is there anything the Scottish Government can do to alleviate that situation before the new bill becomes law? So uh, we require primary legislation in order to alter this. So um, uh, there is no quick fix uh, in terms of uh, uh, some other way in which we can deal with the um, issue. Um, so the bill and the provisions in this bill uh, that will address it will help to restate it. And I do think it's, again, it's um, um, I think there's been a tremendous amount of work taken forward in order to make sure that there were refresher courses available uh, uh, within the trade and through the licensing boards. Um, and clearly some people have uh, missed out on that uh, for whatever reason that may be. And I think the five-year period that they're then prevented from having a personal licence is too long. Um, uh, so uh, once we have the bill... Uh, uh, through Parliament, we can then look at, and I've asked officials to look at how quickly we can commence that particular provision within the bill to try and address it as quickly as possible. Um, uh, uh, so once we've got the bill uh, uh, with the consent of Parliament, uh, uh, through its parliamentary process, uh, we'll look to try and commence that provision as early as we can uh, in order to try and address this issue. But uh, I, I know that some MSPs have written to me with um, various options that they think may be available to try and address it. We have looked at these issues legally and we can't do that. It requires primary legislation. So this is the quickest way for us to deal with the matter. Um, obviously, when the um, personal licence holders were introduced, there was um, um, some um, quite definite um, intentions there um, with regards to the selling of alcohol to people. Now, we took some evidence from one of the um, legal representatives from the council um, who was concerned at the lack of prosecutions for people selling to people who are drunk, because obviously the big consideration for a lot of people is, is the antisocial aspect of, of people being drunk in the community. Um, and when asked Police Scotland about this, when they, and they were giving evidence, they said that it was really a very difficult thing to establish, so that they, they didn't actually use that part of the legislation. Um, does that concern you that there's maybe a gap there where there was an intention that um, it would be more difficult, you know, people would have to have more responsibility who were licence holders, but that, that's not actually been enforced at the moment. I think, uh, uh, in terms of the review, was it an issue about there was a lack of prosecutions or a lack of reporting? Well, the, 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 I'm, I'm pretty sure that the representative from, um, I think it was Middle Lothian Council, said it was lack of prosecutions, but the police said that it was very difficult to 
establish what drunk meant, basically, um, and who had sold it on, you know, um, who was responsible for the selling to a person who then um, was involved in antisocial or, you know, um, a, a public display of drunkenness after that. That okay. point. Because um, uh, obviously there's two aspects to it. One is the reporting of it for the police to be able to investigate it and then to report the matter on to the Procurator Fiscal. Any decision on prosecution would be a matter for the Procurator Fiscal and uh, uh, the Crown Office. So um, uh, we can't direct that. Um, uh, and they will, uh, if. I would be interested, though, if they are saying that cases are being reported to the Procurator Fiscal's Office and are not being prosecuted or whether it's a case of the police are saying that in those circumstances there isn't sufficient evidence for us to actually put a report even to the Procurator Fiscal and those individual circumstances. Um, I think it's important that the, the power is there. My, my view would be is probably more around a pattern emerging uh, in a particular establishment on a regular basis. And I'm sure that members at various times have had representations from local communities about particular localised issues. Um, uh, so uh, that there would be better scope in order to look at taking that forward. But I, I think uh, there's a, a distinction to be made, I think, uh, which is where the police feel as though it's difficult to prove in individual cases and demonstrate it, therefore to report it on, or where there are cases going to the Procurator Fiscal's Office which they are choosing not to prosecute uh, and what uh, grounds they are on. So, um, uh, uh, I think it'd be important to clarify that, and I'm more than happy for us to uh, to discuss with the Crown Office where they are finding those particular issues uh, that could assist them uh, better in deciding in cases that should be prosecuted and ones which shouldn't. But we can take that away and discuss that with them. It would be very helpful. Thank yeah. you, Cameron. Sorry. Very briefly, Cameron Buchanan. Thank you very much. Um, we discussed it, one of the other things, the plight of personal licence holders who lost their licence and it was going to take a long time to get it back. I think it was going to be dealt with somebody said, in secondary legislation. Has just indicated that it can yeah. only be done in primary legislation. Oh, yeah, you okay. said that. But yeah. it, it, it was, they did say it was going to could be done in secondary. So what was the. Well, Cabinet Secretary, would you like to reiterate yes. what so you we've, said we've, to Ms. Adamson, please? There, there, there have been some uh, 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 representations suggesting that it could be done that way, and these issues are being considered. And um, uh, the legal advice that, uh, uh, from, uh, from, from our officials is that uh, in looking at this matter, is we need to amend the primary legislation to deal with this issue. And the provisions we'll put in the bill will we'll do that. And we'll look at trying to commence that provision uh, as early as we reasonably can in order to try and deal with this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have at this moment in time uh, 11 out of 40 licensing boards that have not published licensing policy, policy statements. Um, and we've got 17 that don't have uh, over provision statements. What action can the government take to address this situation and make sure um, that the system works properly um, for the people of Scotland? You know, I think it's um, uh, licensing boards being the very nature of them are that quasi-judicial body that, um, uh, uh, that are, to a large extent, sit to the side of the local authority and themselves with the local authority members who are on it. So I think it's important that um, uh, we provide them with the right type of support and assistance in order to achieve that. I think I'll ask Peter maybe just to explain a wee bit about some of the work that has been undertaken in order to try and make sure that those licensing boards uh, that haven't taken forward the licensing policies or updated them and also over provision statements, um, uh, the measures that we have been taking forward to try and help them to encourage them uh, uh, to make sure that they, they take forward a, an appropriate statement or policy. Yeah. Uh, the licensing policy statement is sort of a, a relatively new innovation in licensing in certain licensing regimes. The intention is that it's sort of a shift, it, it provides a shift to a more policy based regime that the local authorities can then, you know, the, the, the licensing boards can then adopt. A regime more akin to something like planning, where you've got overall plans and you use and you deliver sort of. To, within an overall strategy. Uh, that, in that way, the licensing policy statement is sort of intended to be sort of a tool to assist the boards in, in deciding how they want to deliver uh, you know, the overarching strategy. And the over-provision assessment within that then gives them a very strong ground for refusal of a of a license or a major variation should they choose to do so. So it's very, I would very much see it as a tool that's available there to allow them to support them in their decision making. It is unfortunate that some 
licensing boards have been have, have failed to be as proactive as they should be and really grasp the opportunity to, to use you know the licensing regime in that sort of strategic manner and I think proactive you said and the minister, uh, the cabinet secretary talked about enlightened boards proactive boards now you're talking about boards that have failed to be proactive uh, would it not be fair to say um, that they're actually not carrying out the duty that they should be doing in serving the public in their area by not having uh, these in place to ensure um, that they are able to, to have some say uh, in what uh, is going on? And is it the fact that the fact that they don't have um, these things in place means it's much easier uh, for them to be defeated in court? In part, but do you, I... I think we would accept that there are, you know, the licensing boards face a wide variety of very different circumstances, that the issues, the sort of issues that we might be discuss discussing in relation to over-provision and some of this sort of other material would be con con included in a licensing policy statement might be far, far more germane and faster moving in certain areas. You know, certain areas have been very proactive in, you know, I, I wasn't meaning, I wasn't seeking to tar them all with the same same brush. You know, some, there, are, there, are, there are major issues in some areas. In other areas, it's, it's more of a steady state and there's, you know, there is less change from year to year. So it's, it's perfectly appropriate that some licensing boards probably are not quite so proactive in their you know, updating these documents because actually they've probably not seen much need to. Not proactive or damned useless? That's not for me to say. I think, I think, uh, I think, I think you, you do raise a fair point. Um, in terms of the, uh, uh, the fact that some uh, licensing boards have been uh, less proactive. And I would um, uh, clear this is an issue that's concerned the committee. Um, uh, and I'd be uh, more than happy to consider any views that the committee have on how you feel that could be more readily addressed and what particular measures you believe would assist in helping to address that. Uh, uh, to see if there's further work that we can take forward in order to deal with uh, uh, those boards that are not being as proactive as either the committee or I would like to see them being. Thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. We will now move on to uh, taxi and private hire car licensing. Um, Cabinet Secretary, um, one of the things which uh, we have found during the course of our ever evidence-taking session is that this is a uh, ever-moving feast in terms of new technologies um, and uh, we, we're very keen uh, to hear about how we can future-proof or actually come back um, to uh, this area uh, in the near future if need be. Uh, we have the app-based uh, company models now in place in many parts of the world and only today we've seen in the Scotsman that one company is hoping to establish a presence um, in Edinburgh and Glasgow. How do we ensure, uh, Cabinet Secretary, that we continue on with the regime that we have here where a, uh, a, a car uh, is licensed and an individual is licensed uh, to deal uh, with uh, the, the, the public. I always look at this uh, from the aspect of would I be happy uh, for one of my nieces to step into a car um, and under the current situation where we have licences for vehicles, licences for drivers, that pacifies me. How do we ensure that that continues and that any of the new companies that enter the market don't get away without having uh, their transport and their drivers licensed? Well, there is a requirement uh, that uh, if you're operating as a taxi, you need a taxi license, or if you're operating as a private hire, you need to have a, a private hire uh, license. So we have an existing uh, legal framework in place. Um, whether you're ordering a taxi over uh, using an app, uh, which some of the taxi companies use themselves and some of the private hire companies use themselves, I've got no doubt we'll see more of that in the years to come. If um, uh, someone is uh, operating as a private hire um, uh, without a private hire licence, then they're committing an offence. Uh, so we have a regulatory regime in place um, that uh, no matter how you are, uh, you are ordering your taxi or private hire, um, that you have to comply with the licensing regime we have in place. And 
Uh, clearly, there is an enforcement issue that if there is a company uh, using an app that is uh, allowing private hire cars to operate uh, without having uh, a, a private hire licence in place, uh, then uh, those particular drivers are committing an offence. There is also the provision that there is a, a licensing provision for booking offices um, as well. So um, I think we have a, a fairly robust system in place and we can also alter that going forward through secondary legislation as need be. Um, uh, what's important is to make sure that it's being appropriately enforced as well. In terms of the booking office, um, uh, does the booking office itself uh, have to be in the local authority area that the company is operating in? Or is it possible to have a booking office for the whole of Scotland? Uh, there seemed to be some debate round about the uh, Civic, Civic Government Scotland Act uh, and the conditions of that. Um, also, what is the definition of a booking office? Could a booking office be established in somebody's uh, front room or the cupboard under the stairs? Oh, it's an interesting place to have a booking office, I would imagine. But, uh, um, do you call, um, uh, uh, Peter is probably a better place to tell you in, in relation to where uh, uh, the booking office has to be placed for the purpose of the licence. What I, what I do think is important is that we have a, a robust uh, legislative framework in place there. And uh, even with the is issue of new technology, that still has to be complied with. Um, and it's important that we enforce that and make that very clear. But in terms of the specific locations, uh, Peter, can maybe explain to you how the licensing regime operates? Yeah, yes. We, uh, we were interested in the conversations that, that were had at the evidence gathering sessions and the different views that were expressed. Having a look, it, the booking office regime is, is entirely in secondary legislation, so it's been created under secondary legislation and we could also amend it within secondary legislation. Therefore, it's not something that we would be compelled to amend within the scope of the bill. Our view, looking at it quickly, was that the, the premises would have to be licensed where the order was taken, you know, the premises where the order were taken. However, if there is if there is genuine difficulty and confusion with licensing being experienced by licensing authorities, then it is, with, it is possible to, for us to amend the, the relevant order to clarify that. The order is taken now you know, with uh, apps. Uh, how can you define where the order is taken? It's not as though I'm phoning up and talking to somebody in an office, uh, yes. uh, wherever it may be. Different yes. world. I th yes, you, you make a good point there. The, clearly, the, or, the original secondary legislation was drafted envisaging somebody sitting somewhere receiving a phone call and that being the order being taken. That, that notion doesn't translate quite so well to a smartphone app existing in the ether and it's something that we'd be happy to have a look at. And you will have a look at it. Yeah, yeah. You suggested at the beginning that you, you may. I, I think it's something that has to be looked at, Cabinet Secretary. We, we, we'll look, we, what we're, we're confident about is the licensing regime that we have. Uh, in terms of the development of new technology, that's why we deal with this through secondary legislation. We can adapt to that if there are particular circumstances arising that need to be addressed. So, um, as and when uh, issues are presented to us that would indicate there is a need for us to uh, alter that secondary legislation, then we can respond to that at that particular point. The coffee, please. Much, convener. Um, during our discussions about this uh, matter, uh, a case arose in the media about a taxi driver who had a series of complaints made against him who did not make this information known to a neighbouring authority when he applied to get a taxi driver's licence there. How can we help Cabinet Secretary to protect the public from those types of risks? And is it indeed possible to share that kind of level of information between licensing boards if it hasn't already made it onto, for example, Police Scotland database systems? Uh, well, it is possible for it to be shared uh, between licensing boards if they uh, consider that appropriate. So, for example, if someone's applying for a licence to a particular local authority um, uh, for a tax or private hire licence, it would be reasonable for that particular authority to contact if they knew they were operating, had been operating somewhere else, um, uh, uh, in order to see whether there was any further information that they should have brought to the attention about it as well. There is also the case about it, um, uh, uh, about getting further information from the police uh, and having a case check to see if there is something uh, on their system as well. So there is a, 
a, a, a level, a significant level of uh, checking that individual local authorities can undertake um, uh, as they see fit for an individual um, uh, and an individual, you know, in a, a particular set of circumstances. Discretionary that the say the, the authority being applied to should try to check that conf that kind of information because it's not it's not always going to be certain where the person has perhaps operated previously. You know, it might be their own original authority where they live, but it might not be. Is there any central way of, of accessing that kind of information, much in the same way that Police Scotland has a national national access to that kind of information? There will be certain information you have to disclose at the time of application uh, in terms of for when they're applying for a, a, a licence, but the, any wider checks that are undertaken would be a matter which are at the discretion of the actual individual license, the local authority uh, and how they take that for within their own individual um, uh, application of the law. So, uh, so there's a bit about the information you have to provide, but also there's further discretion in the local authority as to where they want to carry out further checks on a given individual. There's not a mandatory requirement for that. OK. Thank you. OK. John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Cabinet Secretary, the issue, one of the issues that has arisen during evidence sessions is the discrepancy that exists between taxis and private hire cars and the licensing of those. We heard uh, from one of the local authority representatives that said that they apply a cap to the number of taxis that can operate in a particular area, but there is no similar cap to the number of private hire uh, licenses that can be issued in the local authority area. They claimed that they were using the 1982 legislation to actually impose a cap on taxis, but felt the 1982 Act currently doesn't give them the powers to impose a cap on private hired cars. Uh, the issue is, is around whether or not it's uh, fair practice uh, to have a cap on taxis being operated in an area uh, but without the same uh, provision being in place to uh, cap the number of private hire cars. And given the differences in terms of how taxis operate compared to private hire cars, should there not be some parity brought in to ensure that uh, local authorities can review the issue of the issuing of taxi licences and particularly given some of these caps have been in place for over 20 years. I think um, uh, these are quite difficult things to measure because of the way in which uh, a taxi operates, which can be hailed and can be ranked, is that um, there is an element where you can measure demand uh, more readily, which is more difficult for private hires, which obviously don't rank and can't be hailed. Um, uh, so it's, a, it's more complex in trying to understand the level of demand that would actually that they uh, are uh, experiencing. With regards to, so that's why we've taken two different approaches in terms of how uh, how licensing authorities can actually measure these things to give them the scope to uh, to consider that. I'm not entirely sure about the 1982 Act and where there's provision. Or uh, there is no provision in the, uh, the provision for present uh, in relation to taxi taxi vehicle licences. There's an unmet demand test. The air weapons and licensing bill proposes a uh, over provision test in relation to the private hire car vehicle licences. As, as the cabinet secretary points out, it's slightly different tests because they're slightly different. They operate in slightly different ways. So it's, it's, it's it, so it provides some a mechanism for them to actually do that. One of the things that we are going to be looking at doing is taking forward some work with local authorities and how they can start to um, uh, apply the measurement of over-provision for private hires uh, and what that might look like uh, in terms of as a, as a process that they can take forward. But it's a, it's a more difficult thing to measure given the nature of the way in which private hires operate compared to that of uh, taxis who are ranked and can be hailed where it can be measured more readily. Before Mr Wilson comes back in, it's been suggested by some that a cap already exists in private hire in certain parts of the country, including in my own city of Aberdeen. Would that be allowed under the, the, 19, the current 1982 Act? I did have a word with uh, somebody in Aberdeen City, and, they're and they, they don't apply a cap in relation to private hire cars. So I think my recollection is that there's very few private hire cars in Aberdeen City. The, the regimes are very different across the country. They, you know, they, they look quite different. Do you private hire cars in Aberdeen because there's an unofficial cap? 
Th there is, my understanding is there is no cap. You know, maybe, maybe they prefer to operate as taxis rather than private hires. <laughs> if the licence fees are about the same, then it makes more sense to apply for a taxi licence. In, in terms of monitoring the, the different uh, local authorities and their handling uh, and interpretation of legislation, do you think that that could be done better and do you think that you can apply uh, the new legislation better than the current legislation uh, actually uh, is monitored? The, the idea behind the, exist, the present or the new legislation is to try and give them some more flexibility around how they can actually measure some of these things and some of the additional work we'll do is assisting them in how to go about doing that. Uh, what we don't try to do is to create one size fits all. That you know the approach is taken in Aberdeen isn't necessarily a, the appropriate approach that should be taken in Inverness. So we try to allow a level of flexibility for uh, local licensing authorities to determine how many taxes they should actually have uh, and that, that can serve their purpose and the issues around that, and also the mechanisms they have in place for dealing with private hires. So. Uh, we're trying to get a balance between allowing local flexibility, uh, but also at the same time making sure we've got a regime in place that people can be confident in, and it also helps them in assessing these issues at a localised level. Jeez, John, but I had to get in the Aberdeen issue. <laughs> no problem. going to be there. Cabinet Secretary, the reason why I've raised the issue about the taxes versus private hire cars is for many towns and cities throughout uh, Scotland, you'll find taxis sitting in taxi ranks uh, not getting any business. But if you go to the major supermarkets, you see private hire cars regularly picking up uh, shoppers uh, because they've got a direct line uh, to some of the private hire companies. And it's just trying to get to that, that balance in terms of whether or not we're getting unmet demand versus over-provision issue right in terms of whether or not we should be having more taxis operating or allowing the ever-increasing growth of private hire cars, which seems to be happening in many local areas throughout Scotland. Uh, because, as you're well aware, private hire cars do not have the same restrictions on them as a taxi has, in terms of the knowledge, in terms of the licensing of the car, in terms of the, the other issues that uh, apply to a taxi operator. So would it not be fair to try and bring some of the private hire car operators into line with some of the provisions uh, that we apply to taxis? Well, I think the first thing I would say is that um, it's not for government to set how many, you know, what, what, what the percentage should be of taxis and private hires within a local authority. That's local licensing authority's responsibility to reflect local... Uh, uh, local need. What we are doing is providing a mechanism for them to consider the issue of over-provision and some of the work we're going to take off the back of this is to assist them in how they can apply that at a localised level. It would then be for those individual local authorities to then determine how they then want to take that forward at a local policy level. So I understand and recognise the point uh, which, which, you're, which Mr Wilson is making but um, I think we get into very dangerous territory if government starts to try to set some of the limits around these matters. Um, what we're providing is a mechanism and, uh, and the scope for local licensing authorities to determine this at a localised level, depending on local circumstances. Uh, and some of the support what we'll do is to assist them being able to do, achieve that as effectively as they can. Can I seek assurance from the Cabinet Secretary that the over-provision issue will be something that the government will work closely with local authorities in trying to identify, because one of the issues that you raised earlier was that in terms of over-provision or unmet need, there are clear difficulties in trying to measure the private hire car sector in terms of how they operate and how they record the journeys they make compared to that of taxi operators. Well, what we are doing and what we will do is provide a legal framework for local authorities to assess these matters uh, and uh, the support that they need and how they can interpret that at a local level. Um, I'm uh, not going to get into a situation where we start to set limits at a national level and how that should be applied at a local, in a, a local situation um, uh, because you know, rural areas have got different needs against that of more urban areas. Um, uh, but what we will do, and I can give you an assurance of, is that we're going to do some work around the over-provision aspect with them and how they can apply that at a local level and how they can interpret that at a local level uh, in, in order to determine policy in this area. In terms of uh, the rural situation, uh, it's been suggested that uh, 
a number of rural authorities may be concerned about the impact of removing the contract exemption. Uh, would you, Cabinet Secretary, consider making the power to do so discretionary? So one of the things that we are uh, going to do is, uh, through before we take forward the contract exemption aspect um, in uh, a uh, or its removal, uh, 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 the contract or removal of the contract exemption is we're going to do some work with local authorities and just understanding how it would apply to uh, their particular set of circumstances, and we can address some of those concerns through secondary legislation. So, uh, before we go ahead with this, we're actually going to take some aspects forward uh, that will allow us to provide some exemptions as we see fit, or to allow them to apply exemptions as they see fit, um, and we'll deal with that through secondary legislation. Thank you. If we could uh, move on now to uh, metal uh, dealer licensing, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, and uh, one of the things which uh, there was quite some discussion about during the course of uh, the evidence was uh, the definition uh, of, uh, uh, of a metal dealer. Uh, we heard from some of the folks from the industry um, that uh, waste dealers can actually deal uh, in metal as well. How can we ensure um, that the legislation uh, works uh, properly and, and stops uh, those who may not be currently defined as, as metal dealers uh, from dealing in stolen, uh, in stolen metal? Well, we're trying to achieve uh, an approach that doesn't uh, get into a situation where... Uh, a plumber who may be dealing with a bit of um, um, uh, uh, discarded metal, uh, copper and stuff like that, gets uh, themselves classified as a, a metal deal. And I think the, the provisions that we've tried to set out in the bill uh, are to try and achieve that balance as best we uh, can. And also the licensing regime that's been put in place uh, for uh, metal dealers assist us in uh, achieving that. So um, it's not the intention of it to try and, uh, uh, as I say, uh, have a situation where uh, the plumber who might be uh, who might have uh, some scrap copper from his work uh, then finds himself in a situation where he has to register as a, a metal dealer and I think the provisions in the bill uh, should guard against that happening I understand that and I think you know that's the common sense approach but uh, we we heard from uh, folks within the industry about uh, waste dealers who are licensed by SEPA who often deal uh, in metal uh, they were uh, in many cases uh, uh, referred to as itinerant dealers um, how do we make sure um, that they uh, are, are covered by by this regime can I, can I just clarify well, well they're suggesting that these uh, because if they are dealing in waste they obviously have to be registered with SEPA yeah um, as well, but was the view that they also required to be registered as a, a, a scrap metal dealer? Well, the scrap metal dealers themselves felt that uh, these folks were given much freer reign than scrap metal dealers were, and yet they uh, feel that they're often dealing uh, with, uh, with quite substantial amounts of metal. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I'm more than happy to take that away and to look at that particular issue um, uh, to see whether there's something further we can do in that particular area. I don't know whether there is any, um, a, any further scope to do anything in this uh, present piece of legislation, but we were generally of the view that the, uh, uh, the way we had uh, metal dealers defined at the present moment was sufficient, um, and the registration scheme for that was uh, sufficient, but... Um, uh, Walter might be able to say a wee bit more about <coughs> that specific issue in itself. Yeah, the position coming into the bill was that the definition which was in the 1982 Act um, wasn't actually amended by the bill. So in other words, it's been in operation for 33 years and it can't be miles away from being right on that basis. Uh, we are aware of the concerns that the dealers themselves made um, in the course of their evidence and we've had discussions with them and we are happy to look at seeing if uh, amendment of the definition is required for stage two. As the Cabinet Secretary mentioned, it is a question of balance that we do want to catch up some of the people on the margins, like the itinerant dealer who only collects door to door but doesn't make a payment for the cash and effectively they're only selling. So they wouldn't be caught at the moment. So there is a suggestion that we should maybe move from a definition of a dealer of somebody who buys and sells to somebody who buys or sells. And that is something that we're, we're happy to look at whilst trying to maintain that balance of not capturing um, people who are very, very peripheral, as the plumber being the classic example.
Just because something's been in place for 33 years doesn't necessarily mean that it's right, I would say, yeah. uh, Mr <coughs> Drummond-Murray. I, I think, you know, this is certainly something that seems to worry um, the scrap metal dealers who obviously want to cooperate um, uh, and, you know, they feel that uh, uh, others are, are in the same business but are not fail, uh, facing the same regulatory regime. In terms of licensing itself, um, during the evidence that the police gave in this issue, um, it came to light that they deal uh, with the licensing uh, of peddlers on a, a nationwide basis. Uh, would it be wiser, um, do you think, uh, to, uh, instead of uh, license scrap metal deal dealers at a, a local level, to maybe license them at a, a national level uh, and bring in uh, that itinerant dealer uh, type scenario into that licensing regime too? Um, it's possible to do that. Um, uh, uh, you know, I'm not entirely sure how, uh, how extensive a, a, an issue it is uh, or how much of a, a, a problem it is. Um, but I, um, I, I think you know, the, the important point is we're trying to get a proportionate uh, uh, approach uh, in taking forward this particular uh, uh, provision, and it's trying not to inadvertently draw people into the registration process that we had intended to uh, uh, draw into. But I, you know, I, um, I recognise the, the concern you've raised, but I'm not entirely sure just how extensive an issue it is uh, that would require further registration in order to deal with it. OK. Um, Willie Coffey, please. Thanks very much, convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, we heard uh, in evidence that uh, some of the greatest gains made um, down south were in the removal of the cash payment system. Uh, but part of our proposals here to, are to remove this requirement for storage of metal in 40, for 48 hours. Um, we also heard that uh, it's, some felt that it's unlikely that the police are able to respond to inspecting premises within 48 hours, so I was wondering what your thoughts were on how effective that might be to, to aid the detection of metal theft if we remove the 48 hour requirement and the police have a difficulty in inspecting premises within that time frame in any case. Well, this again is an example of trying to take a proportionate uh, approach because uh, once a, a metal dealer holds certain types of metal for a, a particular period of time, they then end up having to get into registration from CEPA, et cetera, um, uh, which can add a significant burden to that. Then there were particular time thresholds around certain types of metal type. Uh, uh, there was also a need for, um, example, once you get into that, and they have to have that uh, uh, certification from CEPA, is that how it's stocked as well has to change in terms of individual piles, et cetera. And for many of the scrap metal dealers, they just don't have the space or anything to be able to accommodate that. So we've tried to, again, take a balanced approach to recognise that there is a potential that we could push the burden so far that for many of these metal dealers, it just becomes unsustainable and it's not possible to operate your business because of the additional regulation they would then have to face for holding certain metals and for how that would have to be stored against also trying to make sure we've got a reasonable enforcement regime uh, that's able to deal with what is uh, and what has been a big problem with the um, uh, with the metal theft as well. So, um, again, it's trying to uh, balance these off, and I think the approach that we have taken is to try and achieve that a balance as appropriately as we can, and the uh, the time frame is a reflection of that. Mm. Do, 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 do you think similarly the, the greatest gain for us will be in the removal of the cashless element of this, because it seemed to have a significant effect for those who gave evidence uh, from. Uh, jurisdiction down south? Uh, down south have now had this, I think, for, for a year or two. Um, it appears to have made a significant impact. So um, I think it will, uh, because it creates that uh, uh, auditable trail uh, to be pursued uh, as well. And I think it will also uh, place a challenge on those who may have uh, got uh, metals uh, uh, illegally uh, from uh, places that have been much greater difficulty in being able to dispose of these things uh, uh, because of the way in which payment will have to be uh, carried out. So I think it will act both as a deterrent and also it will assist us in the, being able to investigate cases uh, in pursuing cases where there have been uh, which, where, uh, where uh, metal that's been gained illegally uh, has taken place. Thank you. Thank you. Cameron Buchanan, please. 
convener, you've actually answered my question. It was about the advantage of a national license. I wasn't sure if you think it's a very good idea to have a national license. Well, I'm, I'm trying to, I think it's trying to take a proportionate approach to these things at a localised level. Um, and I'm uh, keen for local authorities to be able to take that forward in a way that they see as best fits. And I think the regime we've set out, I think, can best help achieve that rather than moving to a national registration scheme. Uh, John Wilson, please. Cabinet Secretary, we heard in one evidence session from uh, some of the power companies uh, regarding the cost of the scrap metal. Uh, now, the, what they were effectively arguing is the, the piece of metal that, or the, the wiring or cabling that's stolen may have a fairly insignificant value, but the cost of the damage that has done uh, and the, the stealing of that cabling could run into uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of pounds and could endanger life uh, and someone's, uh, the, of the area that's affected. And in your role as the Cabinet Secretary, how would you like to see the value, not of just the, the metal stolen and the, act, the criminal act is taking place, but how can we incorporate the overall cost of the damage that's being caused uh, to the, you know, the energy companies, to households and others, when individuals are being considered in courts for the theft of that uh, cabling or metal? Cabinet Secretary. Well, you know, we are in a situation where it's really for the courts to determine that, um, and it, it wouldn't really be appropriate for the government to set down uh, in terms of what it would expect the court to do in terms of um, uh, 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 deal with these costs. You know, uh, I'm, I'm sure, you know, uh, members are aware that, you know, courts will look at the whole mitigating, whole range of mitigating circumstances, including the costs associated and the relative damage and the uh, uh, a danger uh, that someone committing metal theft may have caused when it comes to determining a, a, a sentence, but the uh, final determination of that would be a matter for the courts in itself. But I think there is absolutely no doubt, you know, that I've, I've heard of cases where metal theft has taken place, where not only have, they, uh, have, the, have those carrying out the theft um, uh, caused others to put themselves in danger, they've put themselves in very significant danger in order to get the metal as well uh, and placed a lot of other people uh, at significant inconvenience, including power cuts. You know, I suffered a power cut myself um, uh, a number of months back from a metal theft or an attempted metal theft that was taking place in some power, uh, in, a, in, a, in a, uh, some, I think it was a Scottish power uh, facility. So, um, you know, it's a serious issue. And I think some of the additional measures we're taking is to recognise that in order to deal with this much more effectively and I, but I've got no doubt that courts will take these things extremely seriously. Um, uh, but I would be, uh, it's not for me to start determining what, what courts should actually do in itself. And I would be, uh, I'd be very reluctant to go down that particular route, um, uh, given their independence. Yeah, I'm well aware of the independence of the court judicial system in uh, Scotland and the UK, the Cabinet Secretary. But what I'm keen to try and ensure is when the police and the procurator fiscal office are taking forward cases, that they actually look at the, the total cost of the damage that's been done by the theft of cabling or other metals in a, to a community, so that when they, someone does appear in front of the court system, that it's not just for the theft of uh, £200 or £1,000 worth of cabling uh, they're facing the, the offence for, but other factors, including the cost of actually repairing the damage that's been caused, is taken into consideration so that the courts can fully understand uh, the, the, to the, the final cost to the damage, not just in terms of the value of the, the metal stolen, but to the other issues that are uh, caused by the, the theft of that metal. Yeah, I, I, you know, I would expect in a, a case that's been prosecuted in the courts, the overall cost to be something that would actually form part of the case um, in, in making sure that the, the, that was brought to the attention of the court. So I would, I would expect that to be part of the, the, the facts that are presented in a prosecution, um, uh, in my own mind. Um, but I, uh, uh, how much weight an individual sheriff or judge applies to that is obviously for their determination, but I would certainly expect it to be something that would be part of the information that is put before the court um, uh, when, a co uh, when a case has been prosecuted. 
Thank you. Cara Hilton, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, we heard um, evidence that change in the law in, in itself doesn't reduce crime, and this, this is the case in England and Wales, where it seemed to be specific in enforcement action that made the difference. So I'd be keen to hear more about what plans the Scottish Government has to encourage and resource um, enforcement action to support the new um, licensing regime when it comes into place. <coughs> A major part of the enforcement is for Police Scotland to take forward and um, I'm confident that they've got the resources to be able to do that effectively. I think the other measures that we're putting in place assist them in being able to investigate these matters more thoroughly. So the, uh, the <coughs> issue about um, uh, not being able to pay cash for the, uh, for the metal, again, also the, uh, 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 having to require to take down details as well. All of these things create an audible, an auditable trail which allow anyone who's investigating something from the police to be able to trace issues much more effectively and to, uh, and to look at who was involved in, uh, in, in procuring uh, the metal in the first place. So I think the measures will assist us in being able to tackle some of that. Uh, but I'm also confident that Police Scotland have got the resource uh, in order to uh, be able to take forward appropriate enforcement measures as they see fit. Okay. Uh, in terms, going back to, to Mr. Uh, Wilson's comment uh, about the uh, offence, uh, the uh, draft bill itself says a person who commits an offence under this section is liable in summary conviction to a fine not exceeding level five in the standard scale. A level five fine is not that high, is my understanding. I can, you, I can give you some details on that further. Yeah, yeah you are right that the penalties are but well, in our view, are probably inadequate, and it is something we may seek to address at stage two. OK, thank you very much. Can I suggest that we take a very short comfort break uh, before we move on to the final couple of furlongs? Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, a five-minute break. I suspend for five minutes.
Okay, we now move on to the provisions of the bill that uh, deal with sexual entertainment uh, licensing. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, during the, the course of our evidence taken, one of the things which we found in terms of frustrations from uh, members of the public uh, are the different bodies that deal with dis different aspects uh, of sexual entertainment. Uh, obviously, Bright Crew uh, uh, highlighted the alcohol aspects. Some of the aspects are dealt with by licensing uh, committees rather than licensing boards. And one of the things which we found is that planning authorities are responsible in terms of advertising out with premises, which seems to be a, a major problem. Um, we realise that cer certain aspects of this are being brought together, but would it not be better to bring all aspects of sexual entertainment, licensing uh, and advertising uh, under the remit of one body um, so that the public know where to go to if they have a complaint about a particular venue? Um, I, I can see the attraction of that. I think, though, um, uh, clearly our uh, licensing boards have a very specific statutory function to undertake, um, uh, uh, which is uh, somewhat different but similar to that of the licensed committees within uh, local authorities. Um, I would be reluctant to go down the route of just having one single um, a committee or board that was responsible for taking forward all of these licensing provisions. I think there may be a practical challenge around taking forward some of that work at a local level uh, for uh, those who would be members of uh, the licensing board that would deal with it all. Um, uh, and there are also uh, some particular specialities. I think you know one of the benefits we can get from uh, licensing boards is that you have a, a group of elected members who have had additional specialist training and have developed an expertise and understanding around alcohol licensing matters. Um, and I think that's something that we should value. So I'd be, I'd be inclined to retain the approach that we have at the present moment. That's not to say there isn't always scope for improving how they are operating. When it comes to an individual wanting to make a complaint, you know, there, is, uh, there shouldn't be any reason within a local authority that if someone's actually wanted to make a complaint about a particular thing, whether it be to do with alcohol or whether to do with some form of entertainment, is that they should be able to get put through to the relevant officer who would pursue that for them and to take that forward uh, uh, in any matter within a local authority. And I don't think going to one particular committee dealing with it all or one board dealing with it all would necessarily improve that process. I agree that they should be able to uh, go to one individual within a local authority and get the service that's required, but that is not happening. We had um, uh, some licensing officers in the other week um, who suggested that the reason why some of these uh, uh, regimes were split uh, was more traditional uh, than anything else, and that's why uh, in some places you have licensing board uh, and licensing committee. Um, and uh, I have to say from my own experiences, what I've found um, in the local authorities that I'm particularly aware of, uh, the licensing uh, teams uh, are the same solicitors and officers for the licensing board as they are for the licensing committee. Uh, and many of the members who served in the licensing board also served in the licensing committee. And I think it's very difficult for the general public uh, to get their heads around uh, what that difference actually is. In fact, it's been difficult for this committee uh, and uh, some of the uh, folks who have been supporting us to get their heads around the different terminolo terminologies. And I just wonder, Cabinet Secretary, if we do the things uh, that we do uh, more out of tradition uh, rather than logic. Well, there are cases where that is uh, uh, the, the, the situation, uh, but I'm not necessarily persuaded that actually moving to a single uh, body for taking forward all of these things at a local level is the is the best way to achieve that. And I, you know, I recognise, and given your own experience in Aberdeen um, as, a, as a local councillor, um, uh, you know, your first-hand experience of some of these uh, challenges. But I do think, just given the nature of the uh, licensing purposes which the, uh, the different bodies are taking forward, is that there is benefit in actually having uh, uh, two separate um, uh, bodies doing that. But I'm, you know, it may be at some point in the future, um, if there's a view uh, that it could be more effectively delivered for whatever reasons uh, by one body, then 
uh, you know, that could be considered. But at this stage, I'm not persuaded that there is um, uh, sufficient reason for us to actually look at uh, moving to a single body at this present time. Not even uh, giving sexual entertainment licences uh, to deal uh, with by one body rather than this gamut that we have at this moment in time, which seems to be leading to frustration? Well, one of them is going to be about uh, the need for having a, a, a licence for the purpose of the entertainment they're providing. And then obviously there would be an issue around having a licence for uh, selling alcohol on the premises, if that's what their intention was um, uh, as well. But I, uh, you know, I, I recognise that for some individuals they may feel as though uh, there are uh, unnecessary complications in it. But my general view is that it, uh, uh, it broadly operates uh, fairly well. Um, uh, there are always areas where it could be improved. Um, but I think broadly it serves us pretty well at the present moment and the additional measures we're providing within this bill uh, will assist in uh, improving the licensing regime for uh, sexual entertainment uh, uh, venues uh, and will provide uh, local authorities with the additional powers to, uh, to deal with this issue more effectively. So, um, you know, I think we are improving uh, the existing legislation, uh, but I'm not, I'm not persuaded that moving to a single committee or board uh, uh, would necessarily improve things further. During the course of the evidence that we took, um, both uh, those who are pretty pro-sexual entertainment and those who were very anti-sexual entertainment shared the view uh, that it would be more logical for all of it to be brought under uh, one regime. I appreciate that, and I, I, however, feel though that having, uh, you know, it's worth, uh, you know, from a from a, a, a single point of view, going to a single committee that deals with it all. Um, uh, but I, I think the present system uh, largely serves as well, and I think um, um, I, I'd be reluctant to change that um, uh, without sufficient evidence to suggest that the existing arrangements are not operating effectively, which I don't think is the case. But uh, obviously, the Bright Crew um, case itself showed that uh, one regime was trying to deal with an aspect controlled by another regime. All of that fell foul uh, of, of, of the law. If that had all been dealt with uh, together appropriately, then we may not have had the bright crew situation. Would I be right in saying that? No, I'm not entirely sure that is correct, because there are, I, 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 the bright crew issue was about trying to use an existing provision within legislation for a slightly wider purpose than what the uh, 2005 Act is for. That was the, the outcome of that particular decision. Um, uh, and hence why we are making provision within uh, this legislation for uh, a civic licence provision around uh, 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 sexual entertainment uh, venues. So um, I think having uh, one a board or one committee dealing with matters wouldn't necessarily have changed that uh, because uh, the Bright Crew really decision has reflected that the Alcohol Act wasn't sufficient for the purpose for which they were trying to use it. Uh, hence why we're creating this new licensing regime. So um, it wasn't a matter of structure, it was a matter of the uh, interpretation of the legislation, and that's why we're making additional provisions in this bill. So in terms of uh, not only the structure, structure um, a common-sense approach to structure, uh, do you not think that a common-sense approach in bringing that all together and creating the legislative framework that is required uh, would be the way to do it? And it would be easier for one body to deal uh, with the, uh, the aspects of that one legislative framework uh, in terms of ensuring um, that these venues are up to scratch in every regard, uh, al uh, in terms of alcohol, in ter terms of the entertainment itself, uh, and in terms of the advertising? Well, if we were to move to a single licensing regime uh, for both civic and alcohol matters, we would basically have to go back to the beginning again. Um, and it's worth keeping in mind that, you know, uh, just 10 years ago, the uh, uh, Civic Government Scotland Act was reviewed. It was considered in great detail. Um, it was found to be fit for purpose. It's flexible enough to allow us to be able to add to it and to amend to it as its circumstances change and uh, develop. And that's happened over the years as well. And the uh, 
Uh, other aspect is that um, uh, the Nicholson um, uh, 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 group considered the whole issue about licensing, uh, which led to the 2005 Act. So we would uh, effectively have to go right back to redoing licensing uh, for alcohol and for civic purposes if the idea was to go to a single unified piece of legislation for uh, both of these things. And that would be a very significant piece of work and a very significant undertaking, and obviously well out with the scope of this particular bill. Uh, you know, I think it's, there's a, a debate to be had there going forward, but given the work that has been undertaken both in licensing uh, for alcohol and also for civic licensing in the last 10 years, um, uh, we have a new piece of licensing legislation for alcohol, um, and we also, uh, the, the Civic Government Scotland Act has been found fit for purpose. Um, and um, uh, and I've, you know, I wouldn't, I'd be reluctant to look at changing at that, um, uh, 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 given that both seem to be operating um, effectively fairly well, um, and they're flexible enough for us to be able to add to it and to change it as we need going forward. Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much. There seems to be a certain logic um, in having the same licensing regime, and I say apparently. Uh, these clubs only re make real money when they sell alcohol, which would seem to be that the, this should be the same licensing, because they don't make money, uh, these sexual entertainment or strip clubs only make money when they sell alcohol, that's what we were told. Well, I, I'm, I must confess I'm not entirely uh, au fait with their business model, but I... Uh, <laughs> but uh, would you call uh, 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 whether uh, uh, whether it's just alcohol? But you know, it goes back to the um, uh, uh, the bright right case where uh, there was an issue around trying to use the alcohol licensing regime as a way of trying to manage some aspects of this and uh, and the difficulties that that then uh, created. So um, that's why we've brought in the uh, uh, full licences, which is required for these types of venues, but also to give local authorities the scope uh, to be able to do that in a meaningful way, which allows them to engage with other stakeholders to consider a whole range of other factors uh, before they come to a decision on uh, their local policy for these types of venues. Thank you. Claire Adamson, please. Thank you, um, can I ask you, uh, Cabinet Secretary, about the exemption that's proposed um, where um, a, a venue um, which had no more than four occasions for entertainment would be exempt from requiring a licence, well, what the justification is for that and whether an alternative, given there's quite a lot of opposition to it, an alternative might be considered like an occasional licence for alcohol um, and whether that is, are you considering tightening that up at all from the evidence? Well, this was considered in quite a bit of detail uh, before drafting of the bill um, and uh, uh, again, it was about trying to strike a balance. It was trying to uh, recognise uh, or, uh, for example, uh, the, the approach we're trying to take around these sexual entertainment venues is that there are only a handful of local authority areas where these particular um, uh, facilities operate, uh, and uh, four or five of them. And it was trying to take an approach that would allow them to take forward policy in a way that would best reflect the local circumstances. So that's why we've taken it forward in a discretionary way rather than a mandatory way. So, for example, uh, local authorities that don't have any of these types of venues rather than demanding that they have to take forward a particular policy in this area. So, uh, so there's a discretionary element to it. There was also uh, some recognition that there could be, uh, on occasion in a particular venue, uh, uh, for a particular event, something could happen, sort of idea, where there was some form of entertainment was being provided and the, it was very difficult to regulate that in terms of knowing where they are, when it was happening as well, um, and the, true, the full extent of that as well. So uh, the approach, for example, in England they've taken is that I think it's 12, one a month that they can have. Uh, so in a bar, uh, if something happened that would technically, if it was happening uh, on a, a daily basis, they would have to have a sexual entertainment licence for, um, is that uh, they can once a month. We thought that was too much and four uh, a year uh, was the figure that we uh, arrived at. But of course, I'm open to the committee's view on whether the, they feel that's the right balance that's been struck. It was largely to reflect that there could be occasions where, uh, un, from an unintended point of view, 
uh, a venue finds itself that it may have actually required that additional licence, and it would be very difficult for us to regulate that or to understand the full extent of that. And this was the, an attempt to try and get that balance. Only concern in that, Minister, uh, the Cabinet Secretary, is, uh, is ambiguity then, whereas with licensing, you don't sell alcohol unless you have a licence, either an occasional licence or a full licence. And I, th I think maybe there's, there's just um, more ambiguity in that situation, whereas if premises new... Um, they had to have a licence. I think it might um, give better clarity to it, but I'd be more than happy to hear some of the, um, your thoughts on it as we progress with the bill. Yeah, and I'm more than happy to you know, listen to the, the committee's views on these matters. If you feel that the balance that we have tried to strike isn't quite the right balance in the committee's view, and, uh, you know, I'm more than, I'm more than uh, happy to consider that uh, uh, at stage two um, uh, as the bill is progressing. Uh, would the government uh, consider issuing guidance on how existing sexual entertainment venues would be treated if a local authority sets a lower limit on the appropriate number of venues in the area? Uh, we will provide guidance for local authorities uh, in taking this particular uh, uh, area forward um, uh, to assist them. It will obviously be down to the, uh, so there's a number of different things that they have to go through uh, before they come to the limit that they wish to set as a local authority. So um, uh, and a, a range of different factors that they will have to uh, uh, consider. But I would, uh, you call, uh, but we will uh, 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 take forward. Um, uh, we will take forward uh, work in order to make sure that they are provided with some guidance uh, in interpretation of that and how that should be taken forward. Right. John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Uh, we have heard in evidence as a committee from uh, theatre group representatives who were concerned that they may be impacted upon in terms of their artistic expression uh, by some uh, vexatious complaints or other uh, individuals using the legislation as proposed to shut down certain theatre productions. Could the Cabinet Secretary give any assurances to those theatre companies that where there is uh, nudity or other uh, issues contained within uh, theatre productions that they would be exempt or potentially exempt from the legislation as proposed? And, that's, uh, and I think that's a fair point uh, to be raised, and it's a reasonable concern for some establishments to actually have. Um, uh, and that's why we're going to take forward uh, some guidance in order to uh, give some specific direction around this area as well about the types of uh, premises and circumstances that would be exempt in these circumstances. So that could be, for example, a theatre production that does involve some nudity in it um, uh, 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 for a particular uh, a particular performance, uh, a series of performances that they're operating. So, yes, we are going to address that through the guidance and some of the secondary uh, provisions that we'll take forward to uh, to ensure that that type of issue doesn't come about. The other issue, Cabinet Secretary, is the one raised by the convener earlier in terms of what advice and guidance, and you've indicated that guidance would be issued to local authorities in relation to whether or not they actually wanted to reduce the number of premises that were providing sexual entertainment in particular areas, or in the case of some authorities who decide to go for a zero tolerance policy in relation to premises uh, and basically have, having a blanket ban on uh, any sexual entertainment venues in the local authority. Uh, how would that fit into, say, for instance, Edinburgh or Glasgow were to go for a zero tolerance policy and what is argued by some in the industry as grandfather rights uh, that they may have in relation to ongoing provision of premises? Well, one of the things that... Um, local authorities will have to do in coming to the desirable number that they may set at a local level is that they have to go through a rational process of how they've arrived at that particular uh, uh, figure. So about uh, consultation, engagement, uh, uh, decision-making process. So it's not an unfettered um, uh, uh, power that they have. They have to be able to uh, uh, set that out and to show it was a rational approach that they took to come into that final determination. So um, it's important that when local authorities are setting what will be their desirable number, uh, and that desirable number can be zero, uh, that they have gone through that process and 
some of the guidance that we'll issue alongside this is to give them some direction and understanding as to how some of that process, uh, what some of that process may involve um, and uh, uh, should involve, because otherwise they will find themselves subject to a legal <coughs> challenge for uh, uh, for just applying something for no, ra no rational or uh, reason or whether they've considered the whole issue uh, proportionately as well. Coffee, Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, one of the issues that came up uh, during discussion was the employment of under-18s in these establishments, albeit in ancillary roles like cleaning and so on, cleaners and so on and so forth. <coughs> and the evidence that we heard was very much against um, permitting that to to continue. Uh, do you have a do you have a view on that, or is that something that's out with the scope of consideration for us being an employment rights issue? For, for, for under-18s? No, well, it can be dealt with through the licence and provision because, um, as it stands, under-18s are not allowed in premises where um, uh, sexual entertainment is taking place. Um, it would be possible, though, for uh, an under-18 uh, to be in the premises at other times. So, for example, where that uh, where sexual entertainment wasn't taking place, it could be in the case as if they were a cleaner who was in in the morning. Um, uh, that they would uh, be able to uh, be in the venue for the purposes of actually undertaking the cleaning of it, but they wouldn't be allowed to be in the premises uh, at any time when sexual entertainment was taking place. I mean, I think that's, that's really the... the and thanks for clarifying that. I think that was the nature of the discussion. That was even in those circumstances, did we think it was appropriate for youngsters, young adults that age to be working in, in, in these premises, even out with the, the licensed activity? Uh, and the evidence, the only evidence I can recall, Cabinet Secretary, that we heard was very much op opposed to continuing to allow that. I just wondered what your view of that maybe. Um, well, it would obviously be, um, uh, as in banning uh, under-18s from being able to be a cleaner in a venue that's been used for sexual entertainment. Um, uh, I think the challenge would be in terms of within the legislation being able to achieve that um, and I think we would obviously have to, given the nature and the intended purpose of it, we would have to consult more widely on what the implications of that were. Um, uh, I think it would be interesting to know how many of these types of venues <coughs> employ under 18s as cleaners anyway, uh, first of all, um, and my suspicion would be probably very few if any at all. But. Um, I understand the point you're coming at it from, but I, uh, I don't think within the scope of this bill it's something that we could address. Okay. Thank you. Cara Halton, please. Thank you. Um, just looking at more of this a wider issue, um, given the Scottish Government's uh, recognition of the harm that's caused by commercial sexual, sexual exploitation on the position of women and girls right across society, why is it that the Scottish Government um, hasn't decided to ban these types of venues instead of licensing them? Well, what we are doing is we're giving the local authorities the power to be able to license these venues and to determine what the number should actually be. If a local authority uh, believe that the desirable number is zero, then there's a process for them to go through in order to achieve that. So uh, rather than government uh, uh, determine these matters, we're allowing the local authorities to determine these matters. And I think that's the most appropriate way for something of this nature to be, to be taken forward. OK. If we could now move on to civic licensing aspects uh, of the bill. Um, in terms of our call for evidence and some of the uh, oral evidence that we've had here, um, particularly licensing uh, officials from Edinburgh and Glasgow uh, gave a, a detailed critique of the, the legislation. Um, and uh, they well, they, they ripped certain parts of the 90, 1982 Act, um, including the fact that there were no powers to review a licence, no powers to revoke a licence, uh, and major discussion round about the lack of notification. Um, can I ask if the Scottish Government have any plans to review the 1982 Act or address some of the specific concerns about the way it operates? Well, we've no, we've no plans to fundamentally review the, the 82 Act. As I mentioned, it was only reviewed some 10 years ago and found fit for purpose. Um, what we are uh, always willing to do is to listen to concerns and issues that have been raised by uh, local authority colleagues uh, where they feel there's a deficiency in the legislation that we can assist in addressing. 
um, if there's a, a need to, uh, to, do, to do so. And uh, uh, for example, the issue about uh, uh, revoking a licence under the Civic uh, Government Scotland Act, uh, uh, this is something that we are considering. Um, and um, uh, we're, uh, it's worth keeping in mind that a local authority, although it can't revoke, it can suspend, which can have the same effect. Um, as revoking someone's uh, uh, licence. Uh, but um, uh, we are considering where there's further measures that could be taken around revoking licences going forward and um, uh, uh, and if there's a way in which we can improve the way in which it's operated for local authorities, we're more than happy to, to look at doing that. One of the things that was discussed was around about notifications um, and the example that I think that was given by uh, officers was around about a burger van and the fact that they could notify uh, folk only within four metres uh, of, of uh, the said stance for burger van. Do you think that is giving the public a fair deal in being able to find out what is going on in their patches and being able uh, to engage uh, with licensing authorities with any objection that they may have? Well, I don't know about the technical aspect around the four metres for a burger van, uh, but um, uh, I, I would be concerned if, if, uh, if we were in a situation where something like that was occurring, where a burger van was establishing itself and that um, uh, the uh, communities felt that they were uh, limited in being able to, to make representation. I think in terms of looking at modernising the notification process, then that's something we could consider. Um, and I think that could be dealt with through secondary legislation, or would it require primary legislation? Uh, I think we'd have to do it in stage two of this bill. There are requirements in the schedule of the 1982 Act that um, local authorities do have to um, publish applications and licences, but it is quite archaic and certainly not... I think currently they would meet that requirement by just publishing it in a local library or something like that, so it's not terribly fit for purpose in the modern world. So it's something that we could you know, certainly look so, at. So if we can look to improve that, notwithstand, notwithstanding that, there is still, you know, uh, you know, there's there's nothing to stop local authorities as well actually being more proactive in how they engage with local communities that are affected by some of these things. Secretary, because we covered that in a huge amount of depth. And we know that many local authorities are risk averse, uh, and I'm going to be controversial here to a degree with some, but you put two solicitors in a room and you get six different opinions. Uh, let's be honest with you. And when it comes to risk aversity, it seems that this is one of the worst aspects. We specifically asked um, uh, the, the folks who were in front of us about informing uh, beyond uh, those levels. And there was a huge reticence. Now, from uh, our own knowledge round about the table, you know, I, as a, a, a local councillor, used to inform entire neighbourhoods about things. But, you know, the, the, uh, the solicitors at the council used to often go into a huge panic about such things. Mr Coffey had similar experiences. You know, this is not fit for purpose. And while this committee is looking at this aspect, uh, this, this bill, we're also looking at aspects of the Community Empowerment Bill. Uh, at this moment in time. And the reality, quite simply, is um, that what we have here is certainly not empowering communities uh, and is um, actually impeding, I think, some of the good work that the government wants to see done in other areas. Well, the first thing I would say is I don't accept that it's not fit for purpose uh, because it can be changed and it can be altered. Uh, there are aspects in terms of local policy and approach that local authorities take. Now, you know, you've made reference to the fact that uh, there were certain things happened in your ward. You took the opportunity to inform the whole area um, as a local elected member. Uh, and uh, that's happened in other areas as well. So there's, uh, you know, local authorities can be more proactive and I recognise that they can be risk averse. That doesn't mean, because local authorities are risk averse, doesn't mean that the legislation um, is uh, deficient in itself. Uh, but if there are ways in which we can improve it in order to help to engage and to try and push greater engagement with local authorities, then we'll, we'll look at trying to achieve that. But there is also an aspect that you know, uh, local members, as you would well be aware in Aberdeen, um, are the ones that should be setting the course of direction for officials and how they take forward local policy, rather than officials at local levels always determining what the policy should be.
on that all too well, but I think that uh, what we have heard in evidence uh, quite clearly shows that, that, that lots of local authorities feel that they are restricted. One of the things which uh, those licensing officials said is they wanted uh, a link to, to licensing objectives uh, like the 2005 Act. Is that possible? Um, well, the purpose of the 2005 Act clearly is very different, uh, and uh, the way in which those uh, five objectives were set within the uh, 2005 Act were for uh, were after uh, considerable uh, consideration. Um, uh, you know, I'm conscious that you know they want to have objectives set within the uh, uh, Civic Government uh, Scotland Act. Um, what will that lead to them doing differently? I can't answer that question. That's a matter for them. Uh, that, they, that's they the point, felt, though, is that I, felt... I often hear this, is that um, if you just put it in the legislation, then uh, that would be better. At times, sometimes, it's not about deficiency in the legislation. It's about proactive policy at a localised level. Mm -hmm. they, they felt um, that dealing with public nuisance aspects would be easier done if there were some changes. Beyond that, you know, um, they were arguing that in terms of what is currently in legislation, some of the, the, um, the things seem to be nonsensical, including... Uh, for example, those notifications within four metres. You know, all you need to do is park your burger van four, well over four metres away from something and you're out of bash. Willie Coffey, please. Thank you. Convener, just to, <clears throat> to get an opportunity to say something on this, uh, the, the notification process and certainly some experience of that in the past where the authority did not and would not notify anyone outside the radius of the particular application, despite that there had been a clear view that there was clear impact and the public beyond that. And the, and the fear was, Cabinet Secretary, that the authorities may be challenged uh, in, in terms of them seeking objections beyond the, the limits of the, the notification distance that, that was in place. And so they were fearful of, of that perhaps coming through challenge or legal challenge thereafter. And I think the feeling amongst the members was that we, we needed to think more about impact on community rather than the distance away from an application would be much more of, in, in terms of the public perception of this and, pub and receiving public support. It, clearly part of this is down to interpretation um, within a given local authority area and officials deciding to interpret the law in a particular way. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, if, if there are... If there are ways in which uh, the legislation can be improved in order to try and address some of these concerns, uh, then I'm open to looking at that. Um, what I don't think, though, is a good way to go about doing things is putting things in legislation because some council officials don't like doing it or don't want to do it. Um, so, uh, so there's a balance to be struck there. Um, but where there is a a reasonable case that improving the legislation could help to improve engagement with local communities uh, and it can be justified, I'm very open to looking at that because uh, I've experienced these types of difficulties in my own constituency. But I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I must confess I'm a bit sceptical sometimes at some of the excuses that I do hear from council officials and why they don't do things. Uh, when it would be reasonable for them to do so uh, because of their particular interpretation of a particular piece of legislation, which if you go to another local authority area, they've chosen to interpret in a much more liberal way. So um, uh, I think we should uh, be careful in not just legislating for those local authorities that tend to be less reluctant to take forward proactive policies to engage with communities. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that, um, Cabinet Secretary. I would ask you, uh, your officials to have a look at the official report on this. I share your frustration, uh, I have to say, about interpretation uh, in certain local authorities being much, much different from in others. Uh, but the key thing in all of this uh, for me, and I think for the committee as a whole, is to make sure that the public are best served and feel empowered about certain of these decisions. Um, and it seems to me that uh, what we have uh, in terms of certain aspects of the 1982 Act um, is things which fly in the face of common sense, uh, never mind anything else. So I would urge the officials to go back 
that and have a look uh, in depth at what those licensing uh, officials said at that uh, session, because it seemed entirely logical to me. Commitment Convener, we will do that and, um, uh, and we'll consider uh, the concerns that the committee have raised as well, um, uh, notwithstanding some of my frustration at the approach that some of the local authorities take in these matters. Uh, I thank you very much for your time today, Cabinet Secretary. Um, uh, I now suspend and we move into private session.